Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. If you missed an episode or want to get more information about the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Sam Sesti. He's the president at ONU. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing is actually really, really interesting and, and innovative. But maybe before we kind of get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. For sure. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Detroit called Waterford. Okay. Um, kind of, you know, northwest of, of Detroit, about, you know, 50 miles outside the city. Got you. Um, you know, grew up there up until through high school and, you know, then went off to college. Okay, so what kind of got you interested in computer science and, and kind of the whole tech space? Was there like a defining moment in your childhood, do you remember? Or did you kind of just fall into it? Or, or what got you kind of into the whole tech kind of computer science space? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was 13 years old. My parents bought me a Commodore 64 for Christmas. Nice. Um, that was really, <laughs> exactly. You know, I had been an Atari guy up till then playing video games and Pong. I try to explain that to my kids and they laugh. <laughs> um, you know, the sticks with the ball. But um, they bought me that Commodore 64 and I was immediately drawn to it. You know, I learned, I taught basic to myself by reading the books that you could really? buy and trying yeah i made programs for what i thought kids my age would like to do you know? interesting okay so so obviously that's kind of why you decided to get a bachelor of science or, or kind of walk me through what was the rationale behind doing that yeah like i said i just felt that it was something i was really passionate about whether you know it'd be doing stuff on my own at home or when i was in high school the limited computer classes you could take i you know was really interested in those so I went off to University of Michigan Ann Arbor, uh, go blue. And, <laughs> you know, when I got there, uh, you know, it, 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 like everybody that freshman year, you kind of feel things out, you know, take your chemistries and your electives and your psychologies and all the stuff that, you know, kind of getting your feet wet and learning what the college experience is about. But again, when it came time, I think my first programming class, it was Pascal back then. And nice. I was, again, immediately back where I was, you know, when I got that first Commodore 64 and I felt at home and I felt like it was something I had passion about. So I tried some other classes and things and, you know, those were the ones I keep coming back to. So that's where I decided to get my degree. And from there, that's, you know, really springboard to the rest. Sure. So you, you graduate university, you were kind of a developer, you, you led development teams. Um, kind of walk me through your post-university career before you decided um, to get involved with ONU. Yeah, so it started out pretty simple. I mean, everyone is going to have your entry-level job. Sure. Um, I, I, I was in accounting software, which is, you know, about as exciting as it sounds. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. And, I'm programming about things I had never even heard of before, accounts payable, accounts receivable. I don't have a big financial background, but, you know, that's where I was put. So I learned as much as I could. And, um, you know, I got lucky enough that um, our our group that I worked with um, on the accounting software side got bought by a company called Pro Systems, which was, uh, you know, a spinoff of EDS, Ross Pro's companies. And from there, I got put on a project at a... Um, a startup movie studio called Savoy Pictures. And I got to travel to California and work on that project for about 13 months and live out in the Santa Monica, you know, Venice area. Beautiful area. And yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, if everyone could go there, they'd probably never come back, but it, it was, it was great, you know? And so I, I got hooked up with a few individuals that, um, you know, were, technical in that space and understood the business and um they then later once i left there i went back to another accounting um, company with some people i had worked for at my first stint and um a couple guys i had worked with out at the movie studio started a company that was uh, creating a, a kind of a back office system for film distribution a mission critical system for major studios and that's Y2K cool. was coming up. Yeah, it was really cool. And Y2K was coming up and, 
um, you know, those the large studios uh, like Paramount, Universal's, and Fox were in need of a of a new solution that was off the mainframes and kind of hit. They kind of hit it at the perfect time, and um, they called me and asked if I was interested. So I became a partner and the first employee, and kind of from there, the rest is history. Um, they started this company, and now the software that we created is you know de facto standard domestically for film distribution software and probably about 70% of the box office wow. that is out today still run through what's called Hollywood software's software. So that was a, it was a great time actually. That's, that's cool. So what exactly is Onu and, and what are you guys doing? So Onu is really a, a it's a, it's a first of its kind. Um, we saw the need, um, you know, I, I work with a company called the Pixel Group here in the Detroit area, um, you know, it, it, on a consulting basis. And sure. they're kind of a, you know, experiential type uh, agency, if you will. They create um, a lot of mobile apps and virtual reality type apps for big brands. And sure. they were coming across the same um, challenge um, on a weekly basis, which is that um, creating assets for real-time rendering engines like mobile web or augmented or virtual reality is hard. Um, sure. It's it's labor intensive. It's not a lot of repeatability involved, not a lot of automation. So we created Onu to solve that problem and make the ability to create real-time renderable assets, um, you know, take down the cost. Um, the time involved and really commoditize a little more because it's mostly done on a service basis up till now. So we call it a 3D asset platform for, you know, 3D visualization and real-time rendering. And it's essentially the first of its kind. Okay. So like, obviously like I, I get it, but for people that are listening, it's probably maybe hard to kind of picture that. So how do you explain Mm -hmm what you guys are doing to people that, you know, can't really look at it right away. And I I do recommend people go to your website, like onu1.com and check it out. But what, how do you describe it to people? Um, Again, you know, we, we try to say is we can help people market, market, sell, train on, or, you know, service their products using, 3D visualization. And when I say that, I guess it's best to define it. Sure, so, sure. Um, you know, 3D visualization has been used, you know, for years in like print advertising yep. or for like fly through videos or stuff like that, where, you know, you've got companies here right in the Detroit area that do an amazing job at taking CAD files from um, automotive here and they'll make beautiful 3D renders out of. Um, those CAD models. So they'll take artists and, you know, apply different materials and shading and lighting and, you know, put it in a desert or a mountain backdrop or wherever it's supposed to be. And it never really existed, that shot. They made it. Sure. And, but it's all been very static. So it's like, you know, it's like a comic book, if you will, versus what we're doing is more like an animated cartoon, real time, you know, interactive, um, you know, gives users the ability to look at a product like, you know, say a football helmet, zoom in, zoom out, rotate it around, see how it actually looks on the inside through, you know, exploding it apart and and things like that. So again, our, our technology is able to take from the very beginning, let's use that football helmet example. Sure. Because we work with a football helmet company here in Detroit called Zenith Helmets. Um, And what they were able to do is, We took their CAD, they're the manufacturer, so they have um, CAD that they use to manufacture their product. Sure. And they gave it to us. Our technology takes that CAD file, converts it into something that's, you know, um, polygonal, which means, you know, something that's ready for real-time rendering on uh, like a game engine or WebGL. Sure. And optimizes it and removes some of the density, but keeps the same high-quality look that their product, you know, is, is, you know, pretty much, you know, that makes their product, you know, look great. So you add on a little bit of photorealism and then what we can now make is something embedded on their website. If you go to their website, you can shop for their helmet. You can change 
the shell color real time, the face mask color, the type of face mask, the color of the chin cup, um, you know, eventually we're going to be adding, you know, face shields and things in there. So it really takes that process of taking that CAD file and moving it into WebGL with all those customization options and something that would generally maybe cost six figures for a company to do and brings that cost way, way down. Sure. No, I, I think it's, it's, it's really cool, right? Like, it, it's kind of up until kind of you guys built this product, this kind of stuff existed, but very, very kind of rudimentary. And to your point, like you'd literally have to take a football helmet and like put it in, put it into Photoshop, make all the different color versions on, you know, and as they click through, you're just loading a new image. But like with your guys is you can literally just like pull, like you said, kind of like pull it apart, change the thing real time and like move it around almost like it's digitally in front of you right and and you guys kind of tie into the vr and kind of mobile space so how do you take like let's say the football helmet and and take it into like a vr and kind of mobile space because you mentioned obviously online so i'm how do you guys kind of transition to make it so it works kind of on all the different mediums yeah so that's kind of the you know one of the later parts of the pipeline for our platform once you have that cad file in you've got all the nice look and feel applied we then have um the ability to publish it out to different um, engines so webgl being the one that's used online but other ones like mobile um and or possibly you know for sure um, augmented and virtual reality are going to use game engines so unity or unreal sure we have the ability to to publish to those and media. So, so then you can, you know, take what would be that helmet or any other product, you know, in the, in the case of like a virtual reality, think of like a water filter, water filtration system that's meant for industrial use. Um, you know, try taking that to a trade show or on a sales call and it's, you know, 10 feet tall by 20 feet wide, weighs a couple tons. And, you know, you can't really get a, you know, it, it looks fine on a mobile device like a phone or it looks fine on a website, but you don't really get, uh, you know, the feeling for the scale sure. of it until you're in front of it, you know. So being able to take, and that's something that's really, really becoming a need now as virtual reality and augmented reality are about to explode. You know, it's already started. Um, people want to create these um, these experiences and they want to create it around their product or their service. And the, the thing that's really standing in the way is creating those 3D assets because, um, you know, most of the CAD that is out there is heavy, it's dense, it's got a lot of data that's not needed for those, you know, those um, virtual reality or real-time engines. And that's where our stuff really, um, you know, comes into play. So we can, you know, optimize them for those for those end uses um, very quickly and very efficiently. Sure. No, I, I think that's that's actually really, really cool and, and innovative how you guys are doing this. Like, I, again, like I, I wish pe or I hope people go to your kind of site and just check out your your kind of your demo videos of this stuff, because I think like it's still like a bit hard to kind of visualize a little bit just when you're talking about it, like how kind of immersive it is. Right. Because mm -hmm. and, and how cool it is to be able to pull pull kind of parts of things apart, kind of like live in front of you to like see stuff because, you know, when you're, especially when you're kind of shopping online or you're trying out a different kind of product, it, you know, obviously the more you can kind of see the different layers is, is really helpful. So what else kind of works really well with your platform? Like we've kind of covered the football helmet and you have some, a few other kind of examples. So just for the listener, like what are other kind of really good things that people can do with your platform? Um, we've had great success with footwear, um, believe it or not. Um, okay. You know, we've worked with a couple companies that are use, that are looking to use it to um, replace the concept of sales samples. So okay. just a little background. What happens is when, you're, when shoe manufacturers are going to create a certain new line of shoes or even a carryover line that existed before, they'll generally create a sample of every, you know, colorway they call it, like a color combination to, for their salespeople to take out and show their retailers. So, right. hey, 
Dick, Dick Sporting Goods. Would you buy this one or this one or this one or that one? And that's costly and it's resource intensive. I mean, you've got a lot of resources that get wasted and a lot of um, money involved in creating a size nine men's or a size seven women's that goes out sure. with every salesperson to every spot. So we've worked with a few companies to start the process of digitizing those sales samples so that they don't have to bring out everyone. Maybe they bring out one or two, but the rest can be on like an iPad or something like that. So they can, you know, get a good feel. I mean, we can make the photorealism we can get is pretty amazing. So, you know, you can get texture and material that looks and, you know, feels the same, you know, spin it around, you know, zoom in on it. Um, but it's just not, you know, you do that without taking the, you know, taking all the resources for creating the real thing. Sure. No, that that's interesting because you're right. You could literally show them like one shoe physically in, I don't know, like a certain color and then all the other combo color combinations, you could just visually show them on an iPad, right? So they could at least just, right. yeah, that's actually really, really cool. So walk me through the full process. Like I'm, I'm, I don't know, like, let's go with the shoe example now. So mm -hmm. I send you my latest shoe design as a CAD file and then what happens or, or is it so in, okay, in, keep going? No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, or, then, or is there a step before that? No, you know, really, all of this starts with getting with us having a CAD file. You know, okay. we're making this, um, you know, more accessible to the average user every day. So we're getting ready to release it where, pe you know, the, you know, any user will be able to upload their CAD, convert it right online, and be able to spin it around in a web viewer like within mi within minutes. Interesting. So, yeah, that'll be cool because there's a lot of pent up demand for that as we as we talk to the market. But in the case of like a footwear designer, for example, there's a couple different pipelines that can happen. Some of these um, footwear manufacturers use um, specific um, software that's that's meant for designing shoes. It's like CAD, but a little different just because you know you're working with fabric sure. as opposed to you know hard hard materials. So we're working with those um, software companies to help create direct pipelines from their software into ONU so that they can just push it straight through. And then, you know, at that point, they've got a material library or a color library that they can then import into our, into our software. And from there, publish it right out to web or mobile. And you really, it's almost fully automated at that point. Sure. No, that that's really cool. So what, what is the cost currently for kind of the version where I send you the CAD file and then what's going to be the cost for me to do it myself online? So right now when you send us a CAD file and we turn it into a 3D asset, that's all a service-based sure. cost right now. So sure. it's just labor. We just okay. base it on an hourly rate, you know, gotcha. times number of hours. Gotcha. The, the great news about that is as our tools get better, the cost goes way down. I mean, when we were doing this two years ago and we didn't have all the tools in place, something like a football helmet may have cost someone three or four thousand dollars. Gotcha. Now you're probably looking now you're probably down into the, you know, hundreds of dollars for okay. each type of part. And that's gonna go down, you know, all the time. Um, when we do get it commercialized for people to do it themselves, we'll do it on a subscription basis. We will be the only, you know, fully cloud enabled um, CAD optima you know, conversion and optimization option. So we just want to do it on a, you know, on a subscription type basis where it's X, you know, X dollars per month. And, you, you know, you can convert up to this many files for that purpose. Got you. And then when do you think you're going to release that? Is that sometime this summer or? Yeah, we're hoping to do it later in the summer. We're right now, um, we're working with um, testing partners to, you know, get it, get the robustness tested. You know, there's so many different CAD formats out there and so many different types of uses and you know file sizes and stuff like that so we just we've got probably six or seven different companies we're working with to just feed us as much as we can get and you know we're just as we see any challenges we work through them and you know at the same time working on coming up with our you know marketing and pricing and all that stuff so that you know once the tool's ready we'll be ready to release it commercially sure so i, I want to dive a little bit deeper mm -hmm. into kind of how you guys are using virtual reality. We, we kind of covered it a little bit, but I, I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper. Can you give 
me and the listener some good examples of how you're using your guys's platform and virtual reality? Yeah, I can. So um, I'll give you, because I've, I've mentioned that we work with the Pixel Group here in, yeah. in the Detroit area here, and they their specialty is actually training in virtual reality. So um, in one case, we're working with, you know, energy companies to help them train their technicians on, you know, um, dangerous type situations that they don't want to try to recreate in real life. You right. can imagine, you know, sure. if you're an energy company and you've got a trainee out there, you don't want to put them in a certain situation the very first time they're out in the field where they could put themselves in danger. So looking to use virtual reality to, um, you know, kind of, you know, make that accessible to people without, you know, the, you know, without putting in the cost and the risk involved sure. with doing it in real life. Um, you know, all the way down to, you know, there's possibilities around, um, other types of training, like um, tactical training for okay. government and or, you know, um, law enforcement, you yeah. know, like, um, you know, right now you have these shooting type ranges where they have these um, different types of experiences, but they're all very canned, you know what I mean? Like sure. the same thing kind of happens every time and they're based on some video footage and stuff like that you know, doing it in virtual reality, you can do randomized scenarios, you can do scoring, data analytics and gathering, all sorts of stuff that you have a hard time doing, you know, whether it be in real life training or in that sort of video simulation training. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's actually really, really interesting. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm curious then, other than kind of rolling into kind of, you know, an online platform, what are you guys trying to accomplish kind of throughout the rest of the year and then maybe kind of beyond? Because realistically, once you guys put this tool in the hands of kind of designers and developers and, and kind of other creative types, like, and I give you kind of whatever's in a CAD file or kind of maybe at some point you guys support other file formats if you don't already, like it's almost like limitless, right? Because if I can export out to unity for example and then i can start writing some code around that for for my iphone or my ipad or android app like it, it's almost limitless correct yeah for sure i mean we really are excited to see where people take it that's kind of the idea with the platform you know as you you put in place the tools and the abilities for the market and they kind of they kind of generally push it beyond where you ever thought it could go so um, we're really excited to have, you know, start putting these different pieces in place. And that will include, you know, hopefully the ability for, um, you know, the creative types that you talked about to be able to do a lot of the visualization within our platform. So, I, you know, there's a product out there called KeyShot that's uh, something that creative types use. And again, it takes in you know, CAD or other types of files has its own materials library of thousands of materials like you know metals and chrome aluminum rubber whatever it might be fabrics you know and you can uh, mock up or you know kind of create this beautiful looking image that can be then exported out as like a still image that people use you know for advertising and marketing across the world again though it's 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 not real time when it's exported. So we're hoping to fill that gap as well, where, you know, a normal user could do some of that work without having to, you know, use these different tools. We could do it, you know, just using the platform. Sure. No, I, I think that's really cool. And the other thing I found really fascinating, um, you have a really good blog post about um, the how to fit a car in a Pelican case. And I, I thought mm -hmm. that was that was really cool because, and, and I'll let you explain it kind of a bit better in a second, but I think being able to kind of, if you can like live customize like a car and see all the parts and kind of like take it apart was, it was really cool to me. Right. Because so do you want to maybe kind of just dive a bit deeper into exactly what you guys are doing, say in the, in that kind of car space and what the blog post was about? Yeah, that one was specifically about, you know, being able to bring large objects, you know, to life um, without having to have the large object. I mean, Anyone that goes to trade shows um, can see where, you know, you've got 
you know, you go to the auto, the auto show or even SEMA out in Vegas or, you know, any of the ones with construction shows like Connex or those, you know, people are bringing cranes and, you know, Jeeps and, you know, giant um, products or objects into, into the trade show floor. And what we're trying to get across there specifically is, look, you know, you can do all of that in a VR type situation and, you know, you can do more then. So one, you're not constrained by the booth size. You're not constrained on the cost that, it, you know, the things that go along with shipping products to a show, the handling and the drayage and all of the setup and, you know, shutdown and all of those things. You can maximize your investment, do whatever you want in a VR situation. And then, think about what you were just talking about, you know, configuring and you know, color changing. And so if, I've, if I'm at a booth at SEMA and I've got one type of Jeep there, what I'm accessorizing with, I'm still only ex- looking at the specific accessories on that Jeep, on that specific model of Jeep, on that specific color of Jeep. Whereas right. if I'm in the virtual reality situation, I can, you know, have the, the cool yellow one, or I can have the, you know, the blue one, the black one. I can, have the you know the Wrangler the you know the Rub- you know Rubicon I can go to any model I want all in that same space. Yeah, no, I I think it's it's actually really really cool and and interesting how you guys are kind of tackling this whole kind of space. But I, I'm curious to maybe dive a little bit more kind of technical um, on on kind of maybe the back end of this thing. So. How are you guys, or like what technology are you actually writing the software in? So from a from that standpoint, we've got um, a good team here that has a pretty diverse background. Okay. Um, we've chosen the the Java stack for okay, you know most of our stuff. Um, we do, we we take advantage of um, AWS or so Amazon Web Services, which gives us a, a very robust backend to build against, you know, maximum uptime and failover and all of those things. And then we just use which frameworks make sense. You know, there's new frameworks coming out every day, sure. some around WebGL, some around, you know, content management and things that we have to worry about. Um, and so, you know, we're, we got, like I said, we got a really good team that um, is constantly making sure that we're using the best, you know, or the latest things that make sense for us, whether it be the React, you know, for the front end, right. or like I said, you know, WebGL stuff. So, um, again, you know, mostly a Java stack, but I mean, that's right. just based on really what makes sense for us at the time. Sure. So are you guys also going to release like a desktop version of the software or you're going to just specifically stick in browser yeah our our um strategy is to stay cloud-based okay. um you said we're really the only ones playing exclusively in that space for a lot of this um you know cad conversion and 3d asset management so we feel that's a good differentiator for us we do plan to create plugins where it makes sense like if we needed a plug-in for a cad program or needed a plug-in for like a unity or an unreal to make our tool or our technology more accessible or the platform more accessible for certain users, but our core will always stay at the cloud. Sure. Are you guys also going to release like a developer kit or is that just not really in the cards? Yeah, we do have full API. So everything we do is, you know, rest API based. So I know at, at some point when it comes to like, let's say CAD conversion, if, if like a large company wanted to create their own pipeline, um, using our API would be fully open to that. Yeah. Okay. Cause that, cause that like, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of thinking to like your previous experience kind of in the movie industry, like they, they have tons of proprietary tools that they would potentially use. Right. So they might leverage yep. your platform, but kind of want their own proprietary stuff kind of out on the side of that. That's, that's actually really interesting. And, and I think what, what I find really fascinating about your guys's company as well is just your cloud-based focus because realistically you could use your stuff on a Chromebook then, right? Like you don't need Mm -hmm. this crazy, you know, kind of traditionally for kind of what you would do if I was building this on the desktop, you need a pretty beefy PC, you know, to actually render this stuff out and do this kind of stuff, right? Where 
you guys kind of take care of all the heavy lifting for me, correct? Exactly. I think you just hit it on the head. I mean, we every day are evaluating different, um, you know, whether it be 3D modeling programs or CAD conversion programs or optimization programs, and they're all desktop based. And I can tell you from experience that our guys are constantly pushing the limits of their, what I would call, you know, supercomputer laptops um, sure. are, you know, constantly shutting down or overheating or, you know, so that computing power is all isolated for each individual, as well as the licensing is a like per seat licensing, which is sometimes not cost, cost effective. So, you know, we figure we can push that, you know, that computing out to us and, you know, take advantage of, um, you know, the, the cloud stuff that's out there and, also, you know, let people, like you said, do it from maybe whether or not they don't have, you know, a supercomputer at their desk and still get the same capabilities. Sure. So I'm curious, did you guys kind of self-fund this? Did you guys raise some capital or like walk me through kind of how you, because obviously, you know, like you have a bunch of clients, but when you're first kind of building this thing early on, did you, how did you guys kind of fund this? Yeah, we were, we're angel funded. So we have some local investors here in the Detroit area, um, some guys that we knew from past experience and they saw the concept. We brought it to them, um, you know, with a, like a business plan and they were all about it. So they were, um, you know, generous enough to fund us out for as long as we needed, you know, before we could get some revenue in and, um, you know, they're still, um, you know, friends of the company and help us out when needed. And, you know, it's, it's been a great relationship for us. Sure. No, I, I think that's that's really great, right? And it's, it's always kind of interesting to see kind of how people kind of, because you're you, like right now, at least you guys are a little bit kind of like client service slash startup, right? And it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of an yep. interesting space to play in. And obviously, you're going to transition kind of into offering more, like you said, in the cloud where people pay a subscription. But I'm still assuming that there's going to be some clients that still want you guys to, you know, just like take their file and do it for them. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever get away from that. You know, I think that's just a, a reality of when you create something, you know, you can, we back in the day used to call it, you know, creating tools for the janitor. And I think that meant, you know, you can't create something that every last person on earth could ever use. And sure. some people just don't want to take the time to learn it. So, you know, we try to make stuff that makes sense for the, I guess, the personas that we see as the most viable, but there's always going to be people that, you know, don't fit into those buckets. So we're always open to helping them out. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious then, so I upload my CAD file, it renders out. Um, how do I, like, do you guys have your own kind of player? I know you mentioned WebGL, but like, how are you guys displaying that on a phone? Do you guys render me out an app or, or how does that kind of work? Yeah, there's a couple of ways that can happen on a phone. Let's just talk, you know, go back to the browser. We sure. have our own web G, WebGL player that we've created that, okay. you know, has capabilities that can then be embedded into any website. So, you know, if you're, for example, Zenith Helmets, you know, we create that. We have those assets stored in our, in our asset you know, asset uh, management system. And then, you know, we can give them a code, like an, uh, an embed code, almost like a, embedding a YouTube video onto your website. Gotcha. And just put that you know, small amount of JavaScript in there and then they're up and running and then they can, you know, do all the customization to our JavaScript API very simply. So they could add 10 more colors in the next half hour if they wanted to. You know, oh, interesting. Kind of on them at that point. Um, from a mobile perspective, um, again, that's something that we, we have our own mobile app, actually, it can, you know, we, that where people can download you know, with the, in the app stores if you have a subscription. And then you can put your products in through that. Or we've also done um, branded mobile apps for companies. Uh, Zenith is one of them that, you know, they can have their salespeople go out B2B and sell that way as well. Okay. Interesting. That That's actually... That's actually really cool and make, makes kind of a lot of sense. And then obviously I could export it out and put it into my own mobile app for, with my own developers, correct? Yep, for sure. Okay, kind yep. of like to the Unity point or, or whatever, right? Like that's, yep. that's actually, yep. yeah, that's if you actually had, really cool. If you had Unity developers. Yeah, I know it's cool. I mean, if you had Unity developers, you could use our platform just like we do. You know, except we have you know APIs and stuff. So Sure. So 
Uh, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. Is there anything else that you kind of want to maybe mention that that's coming or is it still kind of too early to talk about some stuff or, you know, kind of where do you think the platform's going to go in the next kind of year? I, I know you want to launch kind of a, a SaaS product, but is there anything else that you kind of want to promote and mention that are kind of happening this year? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, like I said, you know, getting the getting the platform fully commercialized from CAD all the way through publish. And sure. then, you know, I'd love to see where the market takes it. My, my, my I guess we call it educated guess is that we'll see a ton of usage for VR and AR. Um, sure. If you, you know, you're a te- technical person, you read about technology, you can't go, you know, five seconds browsing online without seeing virtual reality and mention of that. Um, sure. And aug- augmented reality is right on the heels. Once the head, you know, the hardware catches up and is really viable in augmented reality, I think we'll see that in so many uses, especially like training and service and, you know, having something that you can put on your head, you know, that's not really intrusive to your movement and, you know, be able to get a, you know, a second screen experience, almost data on top of reality is something that I think is going to really surprise people when, you know, they start to see just how far it's going to come really soon. Sure. And I I think once the cost comes down, like I know Google like has their cardboard and there's kind of a bunch of versions where you just put your iPhone or Android phone in in like a little headset or or your Samsung phone or whatever. But I I think even as like the more expensive devices kind of come down, in price as well, right? Like, I think, to your point, like, I think kind of right now, VR and AR kind of seems a little bit like, maybe it's just for like kind of gamers or techie people, but I think it's very quickly going to kind of trickle down into just like everyday usage, right? For for maybe just people online, you know, with even your own platform, right? Like, I think people are just, it, it's happening whether they kind of realize it or not. Yeah, I think it's where you're really starting to see it um, get really seeded is um, in business. So, okay. you know, actual enterprise application of virtual reality and soon augmented reality. And like I mentioned some of those training type situations, I think service and, you know, education. And you'll just see it start to, to permeate through business. Um, I still are really obviously, like you said, it's been a in a way it's been a toy, a gaming thing, something that people are like, Oh wow, is that really going to be, is that really going to go somewhere? And I think that the answer is now is yes, definitely it's, it's going to happen. And now it's just a matter of finding, you know, different companies at their own pace adopting it. Sure. And, and like companies like yourself, just making it affordable for kind of companies, right? Because you mentioned to your point, like mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, it was maybe a few thousand dollars to do, you know, like a helmet. And now if it's like hundreds of dollars, and then even with like your subscription model, if it's, you know, I can do X amount for whatever the fee is monthly, like the the cost is going to come down so much. And, and to your point, like it's, it's basically instant, right? For, yeah. And, and then being able to just, you know, literally upload something right away and then show that off to somebody with different color combinations and pull it apart. Like that's, that's actually really, really cool. And kind of the future. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's, uh, we're, I don't want to use the word commoditize. I think that's too simplistic, but I think really making, you know, this efficient and affordable and accessible for uh, more people than just the few people that know how to program this stuff is really where we're going to hit our sweet spot. Yeah, no, that that's great, man. But sadly, we're coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about you guys and any other links you want to mention. Yeah, the best place uh, to find out about us is onu1.com. It's O-N-U, the number one, dot com. Um, it has, you know, information about our capabilities and our products and, you know, how to get hold of us and, you know, different companies we've worked with and different use cases and stuff like that. Um, you know, other than that, it's basically just start looking around for, you know, the uses of real-time rendering and, you know, WebGL is a good thing to understand as it's browser-based um, application of, of real-time 3D rendering and, you know, game engines like Unity and Unreal. Um, but there's a whole host of, you know, 
there's a whole ecosystem environment of people out there that live this, you know, these 3D modeler types and agencies and things like that that use all these tools like, you know, Maya and Moto and 3DS Max. And these guys all know what I'm talking about. And sure. there's going to be, you know, this is going to move into, you know, manufacturing space and all those people are starting to understand. So um, we're excited about all that. And, you know, we're really excited to be part of uh, the Detroit, you know, kind of startup e tech scene which has grown um, amazingly over the last few years kind of as detroit's been making its comeback so that's something that we're really excited to be part of as well sure man that that's great well i really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show and i look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day all right you too kevin thanks for the time and it was uh, really enjoyable and uh i wish you the best of luck thanks man we'll talk soon all right okay, bye. all right bye Thanks for listening. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check them out at electricmantra.com and keep them in the future.